Welcome, welcome, welcome uh, to Marigold Live. And we're very excited to be hosting the Tech Forward Cultivation with the Christina Lake Cannabis team. I'm Bridget Hopper, and we're excited, a partner, founder at Marigold, and we're excited to talk today about cultivation, technology, and learn from our amazing panelists that we've got, what, that we've get gathered today um, to talk about Christina Lake. We've got Merv Wojtek, Chairman and Director, Rob Jones, President, and Nico Dehan, uh, COO and Master Grower. So um, before we get started, I thought it would be just great if um, we could start with Merv and then Rob and Nico. They're going to introduce themselves to all of us, and uh, and then we're going to jump into some questions. We're going to talk a little bit about Christina Lake, cultivation, technology and extraction, research and development, and uh, expansion and future opportunities. It's going to be a great hour, or an hour and a half, and lots of time for questions and, and insights. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Merv, over to you. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mervyn Voychuk, and uh, just a little background on me. I grew up in Saskatchewan as a farm kid. Um, that was a while ago. Um, I attended school in a town called Foam Lake, and then I went on to university in Saskatoon. Uh, during that time, I was working a summer job as, in the construction business. And uh, when you know it, I ended up in Medicine Hat as a summer job. And actually, I still live here. Uh, ended up, uh, uh, when I was done school, I bought into the business. Uh, and I became president at 26 years old, and we were in the business of, you know, building roads, highways, uh, freeways, uh, etc. And uh, we, we grew that business from a very humble beginnings to, uh, you know, we're doing just shy of two, 200, uh, $200 million in sales when we sold in 2009 to a public company. So that's my background. It's all been in the private sector. And uh, so uh, I am now working in a public company, uh, which is different, but really it isn't. Uh, you still got to get the job done and, and make money. So that's my background. Oh, thank you so much. And, and um, what, what a journey. Um, over to you, President Rob Jones. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, Rob Jones, um, born and raised here in British Columbia. I went to the University of BC and I was just telling the crew earlier on that I graduated 40 years ago uh, with a commerce degree. Um, was in the transportation business for a couple of years and then got into the agricultural commodity trading business where I've been involved in trading agricultural commodities from wheat, oats, barley, corn, canola meal, canola oil, canola seed to the animal byproducts, fish meal, fish oil, meat and bone meal, etc. cetera. Uh, not only domestically, but uh, overseas as well. And, um, and uh, kind of uh, was retired here about a year and a half ago. And then I um, fortunately um, was introduced to the uh, good folks up at Christina Lake and uh, visited there uh, last June and fell in love with the operation and the people. And I'm thrilled to be part of, uh, of the team at Christina Lake. Wow, thank you. All that amazing agricultural and investing and what, what a great asset for the team. And that's what happens. You fall in love with the cannabis industry and you fall in love with Christina Lake. And Nico, you've been there for a long time. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, everybody. I'm Nico Dehan. Um, I work in Christina Lake as a COO and also as one of the master growers. Um, yeah, I was born and raised in the Grand Forks, Christina Lake area. I've been involved in the cannabis industry for the majority of my life. I've worked under all the different licensing regimes um, and really focused on commercial outdoor production, um, which we'll talk about more today. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be one of the representatives for Christina Lake. And I thank you all for taking the time and joining us today. Great, from the West Kootenays, yay, so that's fabulous. So we're gonna start off with a little overview because not everybody knows about Christina Lake. So. We'll have a little overview of Christina Lake. So tell us about Christina Lake Cannabis, um, Merv. Yes, yeah, so I'll get started. Uh, Christina Lake Cannabis was uh, founded approximately three years ago by four individuals with a, a combined experience of over 70 years growing outdoor cannabis. Uh, Christina Lake uh, Cannabis is located in a beautiful part of BC, uh, just south of Christina Lake uh, towards the US border. It's absolutely stunning out there in the Kootenays. Uh, the weather there is typically hot and dry in the summer, which is ideal for doing what we're doing. Um, 
uh, CLC acquired about 32 acres uh, uh, in, I think it was about 19, uh, sorry, 2018. Uh, there was an existing building on it that was retrofitted to suit and a new 12,000 square foot processing building, building was uh, designed and constructed. Uh, approximately 25 acres has been set aside for outdoor cultivation, uh, all in pots, as this is an industrial site, which is a requirement for processing. Uh, the CLC has in its possession approximately 120 proprietary strains of cannabis suitable for outdoor growing, which is a very nice bank to, to own. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the processing facility uh, was fitted with top shelf extraction capability as that was part of our business plan. And, uh, and uh, we've also added a high-end lab equipment to make different products uh, uh, from, the, from the crew. A CLC is, is a low cost producer with a, with a cost structure that is about 20% of the cost of indoor growing. As you know, it's growing outside in the sun, you don't need lights, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Plants typically go bigger. So, so there's a lot of benefit to growing outdoors. Uh, in 2020, CLC harvested what proved to be a bumper crop, um, significantly exceeding uh, our initial projections. And, uh, we'll talk more about that uh, in, in the, you know, in this in this webinar. CLC is currently moving forward with uh, with with the sales of its first crop from 2020. It's taken a few months to to uh, to get our extraction underway to perfect our our distillation and our and our winterization, uh, but it's come along very nicely. We now have some product on the shelf with COAs, and we can now sell something. Uh, a CLC currently holds a standard cultivation and processing license, uh, which, which allows us to grow and to process. Uh, and we are uh, working on our amendment to these licenses to allow selling to, be, to get underway. Um, CLC for, I guess you probably know, but is a publicly traded company on the, the Canadian Securities Exchange under the symbol CLC and in US uh, OTC a QX Exchange under symbol CLCFF. So that's a brief history of Christina Lake, uh, and uh, uh, we, if, you know, we, we'll probably fill in some of the gaps as we as we trudge along this journey. Thank, thanks, Merv. Rob, did you have anything to add to that overview? Well, I I think Merv uh, hit the nail on the head of describing exactly what we're doing up there in uh, twenty two thousand five hundred pots. Um, pardon the pun, but plants, pots, and plants. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Nico, your team has over a century of combined cultivation, growing experience in the Kootenays for the last 20 years. Tell, tell us what makes uh, growing in Christina Lake region so, so special, so wonderful, so effective. Yeah, so Christina Lake is a special place. Um, it's got pretty much ideal weather conditions for outdoor cultivation. It's got warm springs generally with endless uh, sunny summer days with usually generally beautiful falls, which is ideal for your outdoor harvest. Um, generally, it's about a seven month outdoor cultivation uh, window. So it's, a, it's quite a lengthy window compared to lots of the other areas in the province and the country. Uh, the, other, the other reasons is, is that it's, it's always been one of the biggest economic factors in the area so the the community is quite receptive to the business and they've been endlessly supportive doing whatever they can to help us along our journey so that's been huge in our success um, there's also having such a, a a rich history there's been tons of legacy genetics that have been started here as early as the 60s and lots of those are the backbones to a, a lot of the strains that we work with today and you know those people have done years and years and years of trials, you know, growing them within the, within this area. So it eliminates a lot of the risk with the strains because, you know, that the ones that have made it, it's kind of survival of the fittest, right? They're a lot stronger and suited to what we're doing. So that's huge. Um, also, we're we're also the largest employer in Christina Lake, and that's something we're really proud of. And it 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 also makes a it, it's part of our success story just to have that support and ability to have the community rally around what we're doing. Wow, that's an incredible overview, you know, starting with publicly traded, 
the equipment, the size of the package, what you've done in the past two years, and then being the largest employer and um, and uh, the, the legacy background and your strains. That's I, I'm sure that people may have more questions about Christina Lake before we move um, before the end of the hour. But um, thanks very much for that in, that great overview. Let's talk about your inaugural outdoor crop. crop. You alluded a little bit to that. The harvest topped uh, 32 uh, 32,500 kilograms of dried cannabis, 10,000 above target, with mature plants reaching 10 feet tall. Okay. We want to know more about that. So, uh, Tonico, why don't you tell us what your secret is and what you've learned and share with all of the growers and LPs on this call. Totally. So 2020 was a special season. Um, it was one of those years that it was just amazing. It was perfect. This, this, this spring was a little cool at the beginning, but you'd rather have a cool spring than a cool fall. So it's, we ended up having a major heat wave here. Um, the grower, the grow team basically lived on site for the summer. Um, watching the crop and knew it was an opportunity that everybody had looked like looked forward for. We've been waiting for years to have this happen. So we knew we had to come out of the gate strong and pull this off. So everybody gave it 110% and really laid it on the line to, to make this happen and achieve it. Um, so that foremost, it was, it was, it was the team was the secret. Um, okay. On top of that, it was genetics lots of the genetics that were brought in, uh, the, the growers and the team knew how they'd behave. They knew what they would yield. They knew when they would be harvested and, and timing is everything with outdoor cultivation. Um, you gotta, you gotta have your plan, you know, the, the full year ahead because you, you plant different strains for different harvest times with different yields for different products. So that you know that when it comes to harvest, you can, you can effectively bring them in on the timeline and with the resources and equipment you have. So that's huge. Um, our drying capacity is another uh, huge factor in our success. Lots of LPs really struggle with the drying of the product when it's coming off the field because it comes off quick. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to have surplus drying because, it, you know, you can't control mother nature. So you have to be able to control your drying as much as possible. Saying that we had our drying equipment, we have the ability to harvest 6,000 kilos a day. And that's what we were doing on our big our big harvest days. That's six thousand kilos of wet material, which equates to about twelve hundred kilos of dry. Mm. Yeah, um, and then oddly enough, one of the biggest challenges of the twenty twenty crop was the fact that it just kept on putting on more and more mass. So <laughs> it was much larger than we initially anticipated it being, and uh, that was due largely to the fact that. The, the plot of land that we have is absolutely ideal. And some of the genetics we were using yields from not as ideal of conditions. So they really, really packed on the weight once they got into uh, the CLC site. So it was, it, it was kind of comical that one of the biggest problems was also our biggest success. And that was the, the mass just kept coming and coming. It was, it was funny. We talked to the different board members and give updates and whatnot, you know, daily. And then just try to figure out what the target was. And it just kept on going up and up and up and up and up. And, up and that, that was the largest challenge was getting it all in. And we were fortunate that the team was able to do that. Wow. That is super impressive. And I, and, and, you know, when you think of when you think about that, you were waiting, all, wait, you know, the whole community has been waiting for a season like you had last, last year. That's incredible. So what, how did you, how did you combine, um, um, as you started last year, how did you combine traditional growing techniques with cutting edge technology? Bridget, if oh. I can just jump, sorry, Nico, if I can just jump in and tell a little bit of a story, and I know that, you know, I saw a question pop up about COVID and how we were dealing with this in the whole pandemic. One of Great. the, one of the technologies that we had was basically these drying rooms, and we had ordered uh, drying racks from, from China, from Asia, and they were supposed to arrive in early July. And unfortunately, due to COVID, all of the container shipping vessels were delayed overseas. And the next thing you know, we had uh, two shipments, one of two containers and one of four containers, or actually it was one in five. The, the first shipment of one container arrived in late August and the other five containers got held up in quarantine in Vancouver. So you wanna talk about a small uh, area and neighborhood Christina Lake is situated about 500 meters from the U.S. Canadian border. Mm. And I drove down and met a gentleman at the Canada Customs and I said, 
Eric, we have a problem and we'd like your guidance and help. This product had been stuck in quarantine for four weeks. This was on Tuesday. On Friday, it got released. So I would suggest, he would say no, but I would suggest there was a phone call made to say, guys, we need to help these guys out because we were in the middle of laying people off if we didn't get these racks in. They arrived the following Monday. Nico had a great big smile on his face looking at all the, the, the drying racks out there. And we were able to get the, the crop off and put through the, the, the drying room. So anyways, just a small story to add about the community up there and how everybody kind of jumps in uh, when, when it's required. That is an awesome story. You know, when you think about all, everything you'd have to do to get those those racks over in five days that's incredible congratulations you guys and congratulations to the community like that's that's a great start so let's just jump back to technology and um nico why don't you talk a little bit about your traditional growing techniques and um with your cutting edge technology sure so it, it starts from the very beginning so the breeding is the first thing so one thing that we did uh, is we we feminized a, a lot of our seeds. So basically, what that is is you, you you force a plant to hermaphrodite, and then you can you can breed with it so that all your seed or the majority of your seed is female. Um, we had a ratio of uh, six of fifteen thousand that showed hermaphrodite qualities, so it was a very very good ratio. So what we did, what that allows you to do is replicate plants very quickly so in our case we, we created 30,000 plants last year and so to do that it's, it's a really effective way of of creating those plants on a timely matter at a low cost um so that that was a, a trick right off the hop that worked very very well for us i know feminizing is a controversial thing as far as for some growers have had great success and some haven't we were fortunate that we had really great success with it um then we use what's called CMH lighting. Um, it's it's a newer style of lighting. Um, some of the, some people are using it now, and basically what it does is it it, it creates a, a more of a full spectrum, lots of UV, and it, it it's actually closer to the natural sunlight than most of the other artificial lights. Um, so we use that, and that that reduces the the veg time on the plants, and actually creates a, a stronger structural plant as well, and one that is more uh, resistant to mildew and pests because the, the pests don't like the UV and nor does the, the mildew. So that's kind of how we, we utilize that. Then once we get into the field, uh, we use a, a fully automated irrigation system and we break out all our acres into, or all of our, our property into acres, which then are broken into four different distinct zones within per, per acre that are all exactly the same. Same amount of pots, same pot size, same quantity of soils, same amount of plants. So that that replication, it, it allows us to do everything basically automated. So we use what's called dosatrons and we mix brine tanks that inject our fertilizer into our system and then deliver it to these, these micro zones with our, in our acreage. And then we can alter them depending on what their needs are to those little zones. Um, and, and you can deliver more water, less water, whatever's required and kind of tailor it to what the strain needs. Um, from there, when we're harvesting, our, our drying is, is really something that's been great for us. Um, it, it, uh, basically it uses a closed room, closed loop systems that uses dehumidification. So not like blowing to air and drying your weed and losing all your terpenes, it's concealed all in a room. So you're drying within the room and recirculating the air and using dehumidification to pull the moisture out. So you get a higher quality product in the end. And like I said, we can do about 6,000 kilos a day with what we have for dehumidification power. Um, probably the biggest thing, and I, I'll probably speak to this a little more later on, but is having testing on site. Um, it, it was it was an absolute game changer for us and, and a very interesting thing that what our growers thought was the optimum time to harvest cannabis, myself included, actually wasn't. And what we learned was, is that the, for what we were doing with extraction, the actual peak time was one to two weeks earlier than what our, our eye had always been trained to, to let us indicate was ripe. And so that was something that was a huge finding for us because basically it cuts down your, your total cycle time for the, for the outdoor harvest. It, and, uh, 
your product is actually better. Um, so that was an absolute huge win for us with the, uh, the testing. Wow. Those are, those are, so, so just, you know, when you think about, so there is a feminizing, the CMH lighting, the, um, the auto, automated irrigation, and then we looked at the dehumidification and dehumidifier, and then having testing on site that I just wanted to repeat it because you went through it. And I know that people are probably taking notes and, and really trying to catch everything that you're saying. Um, yeah. Rob, did one you other, sorry? One, one other thing with it is too, is that our style, our style for this acreage is very high output. Um, so what we did is we actually grew the whole acreage in pots and basically the decision that we did that for is that we can control everything. Um, there's no heavy metals. There's everything as a COA. It's very, very controlled. Um, we can actually grow strains that don't typically finish if you're growing them directly in the dirt because the little bit of root boundness that you can create within the, the pot structure, we can actually cause the plant to trigger into flower earlier so that it finishes on time within the climate that we we're working with. So it really opened up the door with working with some genetics that typically wouldn't work in this area. Wow. Merv, Rob, anything to add on that? Anything in terms of the growing? This guy's the guru. We don't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why did you choose to focus on outdoor cultivation? Uh, I mean, for us, it, it, it's the business that makes sense for the area. Um, it's it's our largest advantage. Uh, if you're going to do outdoor anywhere in 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 Canada, it's 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 definitely one of the strongest locations. So that's that's the logical reason. Um, also, the team is is generally focused in that. Like lots of our growers got 25 plus years of experience doing this. So again, it's a logical fit. It was low risk for that reason. Um, the, the capital cost for infrastructure are much less per square foot. Um, and also your, your yields are, are, can be massive, which we experienced last year. We had, we had individual plants that were coming out at over four kilos out of a 25 gallon pot. So there were some very, very productive plants that had come out and we look forward to working with those particular genetics further. Um, and then also, also the, the quality, like, uh, Sometimes outdoor has a, a bad name for certain products, but in our experience, when you're making, when you're making it down into your, your oils and distillates and it, your, especially your winterized oil with terpenes, you can get some amazing terpene profiles off growing under natural sun. And that's something that we've really dove into and are, are really proud of the product that's coming off of it this year. Also, there's some of the more minor cannabinoids that really express themselves in a, a higher range in the outdoor environment. So with time as the Canadian market evolves, there, there's going to be major value in those rare cannabinoids. Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned that you don't use pesticides a couple of minutes ago. How do you ensure quality pest-free plants? Yeah. So on the indoor, the CMH lighting plays a, a very large role in that. Um, it is very effective at keeping your mildews down. Um, and then also for the, the pests, we use beneficial insects. Uh, the 2020 crop was never sprayed by anything. Um, that's including Health Canada approved pesticides and fungicides. It never was sprayed, not one plant with any product. Um, and then on the outdoor, uh, we actually worked with uh, some biologists that were on site for the season and uh, they came in and did sampling once a month on natural predators and pests. And then we actually tried to encourage, we have a really good native ladybug bug population here. So we encouraged them, those bugs as much as we can. And we didn't. We made the decision not to introduce any uh, any non-native bugs, just to, in the in the essence that they would possibly affect the natural the naturals. Um, we also used a, a bug called uh, lace wings, and so we would we would basically distribute the larva throughout the fields to encourage the lace wing population, which ended up working <laughs> effectively. And then this year we're we're considering doing some interesting stuff of of planting some companion plants, basically not cannabis out in the cannabis crop to encourage some more of those, those natural predators into the area. Hey, Bridget, it, it was amazing last year when you would walk along the, in, in the field and look at individual plants very closely and carefully, the amount of ladybugs that were on some of the plants and the different colored ladybugs, 
red ones as as you would imagine but there were also green ones as well so it was very unique to to look at the different uh the different types of of, of um quote so-called pests but they were the good pests the good pests uh, that look great and exactly. sound great ladybugs and lace wings i think that sounds great <laughs> The other thing I just wanted to mention, uh, I see in the chat room, there was a, a, a just a, a blurb about pesticides. We even went so far as to, we test the soil. Uh, so the soil was tested for heavy metals and pesticides as well. And we were negative on uh, throughout the whole entire operation. And then once the product is harvested, we go for further testing. And then each stage is tested for pesticides and heavy metals. And we've had zero, zero test positive uh, throughout the whole entire uh, session. Wow, congratulations. That's, yeah, um, that, that'd be another thing on the Christine location being so special is that I, I know other LPs that I'm friends with in the Okanagan and whatnot, sometimes they struggle with drift from different agricultural crops. And we're right. fortunate to be kind of standalone in our area and not, not have to deal with that problem. And one, one more one more thing that comes to mind with uh, this outdoor uh, selection of outdoor growing is, is that the relative humidity is quite low in that area. And that really helps you with your battle with uh, mold and mildew and those type of things, which is not pests, but they're uh, you know, microbial. So that, that's, a, that's another consideration for outdoor growth. It's, it's a lot easier to perhaps manage outside than inside. Uh-huh, good. Um so just before we uh, wrap up on some of some of the growing, um, what are the strains you're going to you're going to grow this year? What strains are you growing? Yeah, so a lot of them are just codes, so they're nonsense to the average person. But we're gonna do we're gonna do a bunch of the ones that proved out last year, and that we've done consistently for many years throughout the valley. Um, they're gonna be the majority of the crop. Saying that we we've also when we when we got our license there was you're allowed to do a basically a strain declaration on licensing day so we knew that day was coming for a long time so we started gathering and breeding genetics to bring in legally when we got licensed and so that bank actually consists of over a half a million seeds that were purposely bred for this project as well as you know over a hundred clone strains specifically for outdoor cultivation so what we did is we brought a bunch of those into play last year and proved them out as, as seed plants. And then we took clones off and mothered them for the season. And those will be the new genetics going forward this year. And many of them were testing up to about 26% in THC. Wow. And the yields were phenomenal. And actually we had harvests as early as uh, the end of July on some of the strains, really stretching our harvest window out. Uh-huh. We're very excited to bring those new genetics in because they're absolute game changers when you get into those kind of potencies. And we look forward to the next years really developing out and pushing in new strains that we have in our seed bank as well. Wow. So, so we've, we've covered a little bit about growing. Now we're going to move into technology and extraction. And um, Rob, have you used drones um, and what are their advantages? <laughs> My first day on site, even just to visit, uh, was back in early June. And uh, I'd gone for a tour with Nico and, and Joel Damarisk, who's our CEO. And we walked into the, uh, into the security room and Tyler Bidnick was in there and he said, Joel, he says, I need to buy a drone. And he said, what do you need a drone for? So he showed him the technology and Joel looked at him. He said, how much was it? And it was reasonable. And Joel said, yeah, we need one of those. So a month later, this drone arrives on site and uh, it took Tyler a oh, well, he's very technologically advanced. So it probably took him about a half an hour, but maybe it was a couple of days. But he got this machine tuned in. So we sent it up daily and it basically takes a picture every second and goes up to a certain height and goes around the full uh, 22,500 plants and takes individual pictures of every plant. And from, that, from there, we can tell if a plant is in stress or it needs additional water or additional fertilizer so basically from the drone, we can sit there and monitor the crop as it grows. So as Nico mentioned a while ago, we've got everything spaced out in different quadrants. And if certain quadrants have got a water issue, an irrigation issue, a, a, a plug pipe, uh, that's detected very early. And we can send out the workers early in the morning saying, please check this one out, please check that one out. So um, I think um, by, Making this small investment, it certainly helped us 
uh, as the growing season uh, um, evolved. It's, a, it's an incredible surveillance opportunity and given your automated irrigation system and how it's all working together, um, that's incredible. Um, moving to on-site extraction, that's been a big game changer for you. Tell us about the technology you're, that you're using, Murph. Yes, um, I'll just uh, start at the beginning. CLC looked at different options uh, in the early going as to what would what would be the appropriate type of extraction <laughs> that we could use. And some of those options were ethanol, hydrocarbon, and, and of course CO2. Uh, CLC determined that the Vitalis R200S was the best choice for our extraction needs. And it was a CO2 extractor uh, that consisted of 200 liter vessels and uh, so with that, you can do terpene extractions uh, initially and then, you know, extract your crude. Um, so it proved out to be uh, the right choice uh, is, is how we're looking at it now. But uh, we also collaborated with Vitalis, uh, who supplied that uh, unit to us in securing and commissioning a what's called a co-solvent component that dramatically increased the efficiency and output of this R200. Um, the, we found that you know CO2 extraction is really good, but it's really relatively quite slow. And uh, but it does have benefits, and one of the benefits is you could become EU GMP certified if you so choose to. But you know, due to the size of our, our crop, and, and we need to get through the extraction, we needed to speed it up. And this co-solvent injection unit, if it did just that, and. Uh, um, one, and some of the other benefits from this injection system, and it was just a, a, an add-on. It was really easy to, to install and commission. Um, but one of the, uh, some of the major benefits is there's a reduction in the fats and lipids and waxes uh, in the crude, uh, which, which reduces or you know, diminishes your, your requirement to remove them, uh, which is a, you know, becomes a filtration problem. Uh, another Benefit is the crude oil becomes partially winterized, uh, i.e., I mean, meaning that the ethanol is already mixed with the crude, so you can go right into the winterization process. Uh, another benefit is a higher efficiency in extraction. We're up, we're up 90% or, or possibly even better at times of, of cannabinoid extraction, which is great. We could never get that with just a monosolvent of CO2. We're always lower. And uh, the, the real benefit here is that we more than doubled our output. So wow. that, that allows us to get through our crop and have some spare time to perhaps do some other things. Our extraction, uh, our extraction system is capable of processing uh, somewhere around 270 kilograms of mass per 24 hours, or if you want to look at a per hour basis of 11.25 kgs per hour. So that's, that's pretty good. And that's uh, that's, yes, that's, that's amazing. It sounds like yeah. the Vitalis R R two S has been a really good choice for Christina Lake. Yeah, it's R two hundred S. It it is, and uh, the, other, the other reason we, we went with Vitalis is their proximity and and the support. You know, we could have purchased some different machines in the U.S. and 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 we had to weigh in on that with COVID and the uh, inability to send techs over. And just the delays, it, it just made sense. And, uh, and we've found that the, the support is, is really first class. Uh, but in addition to the extractor, we, we matched our extraction capability up with, with, uh, with lab equipment uh, in the winterization room. Uh, we, we have a, a, an equidist solvent recovery that's uh, capable of 20 to 25 liters per hour when, you, when we run the two vessels in tandem. We run two cryo freezers that take you down to minus 80. And uh, we, we added a really good filtration system from Infinity. And then on to the distillation, we are using a Delta roll film uh, a short path distillation unit. And it's capable of four to five liters per hour. Again, that's somewhat dependent on how many passes you make. Uh, so we we're finding that the milling, sifting, winterization, distillation, they all match up to our production capability which you know, was always a concern. You wanted to find your bottlenecks and, and we did. So, uh, uh, so that in a nutshell is our extraction um, uh, part of our business. And uh, it kind of gives you an overview of what our capabilities are. So we, we can easily handle our, our uh, crop uh, with, with, with this unit uh, easily and, and more. So we're-, right. we're 
Great. Sounds super efficient, effective, yeah. and uh, and productive. Rob? It was interesting. It was interesting, Bridget. Uh, February first was when the co-solvent uh, unit came in from from Vitalis in Kelowna, and like Murr said, that was a game changer. Where we were yeah. basically processing ninety kilos a day, we went to two hundred and forty. So if wow. we did the simple math, there wasn't enough days in the year, and we were running into issues. So starting in February first, we basically cranked production up, you know, substantially. And I see there was just a question in the chat room of where we're at with our with our processing. We probably we've done about forty five percent of our crop has now been processed into into a form of uh, of, of oil, mm -hmm. and uh, and we're we're certainly confident that that's going to be all processed before the uh, the new crop comes in. So um, and also like Merv said, having the Vitalis guys in close proximity in uh, in Kelowna has has been great. And they're certainly eager. They've got some new ideas. And with us being basically three hours down the road, uh, they can bring any of their new ideas on site and do a little bit or some R&D projects with us. And we're more than happy to accommodate and, uh, and basically use, use their new technology in, uh, in our facility. Wow. So much community support around you guys and, and supplier support and partners. It's amazing. Sorry, Mark, yeah. you were going to say something? Yeah. I was just going to say we got the the very first unit they built and commissioned uh, so we're pretty pleased about that we, we we knew something was in the air we've been bugging them all summer about it so they finally uh, you know so we we were so persistent that they they worked with us and that was great you know so we got serial number one awesome awesome uh rob we we were talking a little bit about um, um major benefits of vertical integration um how does that work in terms of in regards to on-site extraction for you guys? Well, I guess I'll go back to one of the questions here. We had a 10 minutes or so ago, is it why outdoor um, uh, cultivation? Well, it's cost structure. Uh, when you grow outdoor, your cost per gram is a lot lower than either growing completely indoor or in greenhouses. So because we have a low cost product going in, and we don't have to transport it anywhere. We have our own uh, extraction facility on site. There's no transportation uh, cost for raw material. Uh, we can process it into basically um, finished goods going to the, uh, the wholesale market. Um, so everything is right there on site. And I think that's our largest advantage is the low cost and then having uh, our own facility uh, right basically in our backyard. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And how, how, so, so you've got all the low cost, but how else do consumers benefit from your uh, tech forward cultivation processes? How does this impact the consumer? Well, I think the consumer is going to be impacted when we come to market with a lower cost distillate than the other, I guess, competitors. You get the large guys that are growing indoors. They've got a large overhead to cover. And um, I think that eventually when our product hits the market, we're going to have a very, very good quality product at a very reasonable price where consumers are going to benefit from the fact that we are the low cost producer uh, and a low cost provider in the marketplace. And I think that you'll see retail prices reflect that. Okay. Hey, um, I can't, well, we're all waiting for it to happen. <laughs> But, you know, low cost, good value, good quality, it's all there. Um, let's talk a little bit about research and development. I'm going to turn it over to you, Nico. Beyond technology, what sets, what sets Christina, Christina Lake apart from other producers? Uh, I, I, the team, again, the team and the history. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because it, this is a cannabis company that kind of happened differently. You, most of the people involved were involved in cannabis already. So it, it was a matter of just getting a platform to, to work under. Right. So I think, yeah. I think that's part of it there. The learning curve was relatively easier for us as compared to some companies, just because of the fact that many of the people involved are very experienced from the extraction team to the cultivation team, all the way through the, all the processors and everything. So that's definitely one of its huge advantages for sure. Um, location as well, as talked about earlier, um, it's hard to replicate the, the location and the, the weather that comes with it. Um, 
yeah, those are those are two of the biggest factors. And then also genetics is another thing. Um, lots of the early early LPs that got in were really strangled by the genetics that they had available to them. It was, it was very hard to compete with the the gray market that was out there because they were yeah. they only had certain genetics available for them. So yeah. we were we were fortunate to, to kind of come in at a time where we were able to bring in a a very large plethora of genetics and we utilize that in every way we can. That's, that's important. And it leads into my question about Christina Lake um, is one of the uh, few growers uh, that Health Canada has an R&D license. Um, one, one in, you know, select few in the country. How does it elevate Christina Lake above the competition, Rob? Well, I think it allows us to, um, um, to look at some of the strains that, that Nico talked about. It also allows us to um, go to the government for, for certain grants, whether we're looking at equipment. Uh, we've got um, um, a couple of research projects that we're looking at and some filtration, uh, some nano filtration projects. Uh, both Nico and I had discussions yesterday with, uh, with the Vitalis people and they've got a few new ideas that they're talking about so it certainly allows us some flexibility to, to grow and expand using some new technology and also to get some, some, some uh, government money uh, to, to help us uh, through that process. Can you talk about any of the, you're currently working on some research projects. Can you talk about any of them right now? I don't know if the guys in Kelowna up at Vitalis would like us to tell all of their secrets. So okay. uh, unfortunately, Bridget, I can't. Okay. Uh, and I can add just a couple of little things here that, uh, yeah, um, we're, we're, we're going to be conducting some organic soil tests, uh, which we measuring in flows of water and outflows, et cetera. So we're doing a little test plot uh, to, to improve, uh, see if we can get an improvement in our, in our soils that we use for, for water transferring, et cetera. And one of the other things we're doing is, is going to be setting up some uh, web stations for data collection to better uh, help us better understand what's happening with the microclimates in, in, in that area. Wow. You guys are just working ever like there's so many areas that like you're, you're just not leaving any stone unturned. Um, there's a, uh, I was hoping that you could tell us, um, Merv uh, and, and Rob, a little bit about your partnership with Tat Lifestyle and Wellness. That's one thing you can talk about. Yeah, we were approached by TAT to assist them in securing access to the Canadian marketplace for TAT's proprietary non-nicotine hemp-based smoke smokable products. TAT has developed a proprietary technique for producing these hemp pets for sale in the U.S., but was seeking our expertise in, in, the, in the Canadian regulations and how best to produce that product in Canada. So we formed a committee made up of members from each company and are presently in an advanced discussions with TAT surrounding Health Canada's approach to these products, as well as how Christina Lake Cannabis can produce and sell products under that license from TAT. We see this as a tremendous opportunity for both, uh, for both Christina Lake and TAT, and are, we're excited about the collaboration and potentially we may even be able to, you know, to put some cannabis product blended in with the hemp products but that's obviously regulatory and we have to go through the process in order to, to get that, that, that next step. But uh, certainly it's a, it's, it's a nice potential. Yeah, an extreme, and, and innovative, extremely innovative. So um, I'm just gonna look over uh, the list here and we did wanna touch on expansion and future opportunities. Merv, are you looking to add any technologies to your operation? We're always looking to add technologies. Uh, we're, we're looking at improving our our processing in our in uh, of the harvest, which which is basically the shredding the material. We're adding uh, some improvements there to improve efficiencies. We're looking at um, no, we're more than looking. We're actually moving ahead with uh, with uh, more of an automated tray washing systems. And one of the things that that there's a few you know technologies that are in their infancy and. And uh, we're watching the development with great interest is, is harvest techniques, maybe freeze drying uh, is the next thing, uh, you know, and there's, there's just, uh, you know, maybe wet harvesting. Uh, it's not, it's in its infancy and it's not commercially available yet, but we will be there when it's ready. So uh, we're, we're closely watching it. Okay. 
And, and what's happening, Rob, what's happening right now on site at Christina Lake? What are the upcoming plans? Well, um, sorry, I've got some sound outside here. Um, okay. We're in the middle of, um, of clean up the uh, last year's crop out of the pots. So as, as Nico suggested, first thing, or when we jumped on the call that we're probably halfway uh, through clean up all of our pots. Um, we're in the middle of cloning uh, and Nico, I don't know where you're at as far as clones getting ready to, to go. So maybe you can take, uh, take that part of it. Sure, yeah, we've, we've got about 8,000 clones cut already for this season. Uh, the team's doing about uh, 1,500 a day. Um, next week, we're gonna, we'll be planting our feminized seed as well as we're gonna be bringing on probably about 20 more new strains beyond what we did last year um, for testing. So those will be from C, those will be like an F1 non-sexed. Um, so we're excited about that. And yeah, things are plugging along really nicely. It sounds like, you're on, like, sounds like you're on a good track with, with, uh, with the clones. Some Sorry. of the other things we're doing, Bridget, is that uh, we've, um, with, with our new production ramping up, we've got a lot of product that we're, uh, that is finished goods now. Uh, we've got the uh, product off to labs. We've got certificates of analysis, which is required by Health of Canada to, to take the product to the marketplace. So we have, um, we have various uh, products available to go to market. We have biomass, we have keef, we have crude raw oil, we have winterized oil, we have distillate in various uh, degrees of, of THC anywhere from 82% uh, THC all the way up to 95% THC. Uh, we're in the process of sending samples out to at least a half a dozen um, buyers. Uh, they will in turn take that and put it through their own labs, analyze it, and uh, we're hoping to have some major sales within the next couple of weeks. Wow. <laughs> this has been a great overview. We've been talking for almost an hour about uh, Christina Lake and everything going on. Um, if it, we'll post in the chat in a few minutes um, if, if anyone wants to talk more about opportunities and expansion uh, to, to reach out to Jamie Frawley, Investor Relations. Um, but I think if you guys are comfortable, it's been a great uh, conversation and I'd love to open it up to the floor and start asking some questions if that's okay with you guys. Sure, absolutely. So the first one comes from Michael Addison. Adamson. In your ops plan, have you considered off-grid energy generation, not grid connected to both extend your growing season, offset exist existing energy costs and underwrite expansion? So I can speak a little bit to that. So one of the benefits of our structure right now is that our whole crop, we, we basically run our indoor operation other than keeping our genetics alive for the months of February, March, April, and May. And we, we pull our whole 20 acre site off of 40 lights for those months. So our, our energy cost for what we're doing right now is very, very low. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, it's always something that we strive to become more efficient at, um, but it is something that we we pride ourselves in is the the low impact of our of the product that we're producing. Okay, yeah, great great answer. I hope Michael's happy with that. Um, uh, uh, Tommy Loner, I I hope I've said that correct. Given the price advantage, uh, Christina Lake can probably crush the market. What are your uh, revenue projections over three, six, 12 month ramp up? Thanks from Zurich, Switzerland, Tommy. I think, I think that question is better answered by our, our CFO and CEO. And okay. that be something that we could probably um, have ready. And we're already, that, that process is underway. So it'll be Perfect. published. Okay. Great. So we'll so we'll send that over to Jamie for the uh, revenue follow up for Tommy, um, and uh, so the t another question from Tommy is the Tate Cooperation. Um, they were mentioning an overview that you're discussing uh, with HG importation. Um, I think that you know uh, Tate CLC uh, produce has not been produced at the CLC tight site or Tate prepare all the base materials and CLC is in charge of the distribution. Any any timeline 
when you expect to be operational and selling? I think we've just answered a little bit of that, but uh, Rob, did you want to touch on that? Yeah, I think with the TAT situation is that the product is produced in the U.S. right now, and I think that there are some regulatory issues with producing that product in Canada. So that's why we're still going through the legalities and the discussions with Health Canada regulators and how best we can proceed. So as far as a timeline goes on that specific, uh, um, um, I guess, pro project, we're still several months away of, of just of, of figuring out exactly where we stand on that. Okay, okay, great answer. Um, this is from Russell. To finish harvest as early as July, what time did uh, what time did plant what time did you plant seeds? Uh, May fourteenth. Wow, <laughs> just so clear. And does Nico see a significant difference between plants grown from seed versus clone? Yeah, great question. So that's. Uh, I can't speak too much about that because that's one of the R and D things we're working on right now heavily. Um, yeah, the the vigor from like an, an F one seed is is unbelievable, and that's actually part of the reason why our yield was so significant is that we we severely undershot on our yield from uh, a feminized F one cross that we did, and it it absolutely blew it out of the water here. Um, it was it was testing up to twenty six percent deadly consistent and uh, just a, an amazing product. So we do see those differences and we, that's a big part of our genetic program is breeding those, those, those seedlings into clones and trying to carry that, that vigor through. Um, yeah. There is a few tricks that we've learned ourselves over the years and are continuing to learn. And uh, we hope that we can develop clone strains that have that seed vigor in the future. And we do have some. And uh, we'd like to carry that through with all our genetics. I'm sure that, that's that's incredible. Uh, we have a question from Alan Cutler. He was an early investor in Christina Lake, and he hasn't invested in any other cannabis companies. And so he's pulling for your success. And how do you think you will best compete against other Canadian cannabis growers, e.g., e Aurora, uh, Kronos, etc.? Cost, price, quality, uh, and do you expect to be able to compete in the U.S. once regulatory hurdles are overcome? I know that you touched on that a little bit, but but Rob, Merv, do you want to take that? Yeah, I think I'll talk specifically to the U.S. I think obviously that's several years away. Um, Obviously, President Biden has to do some finagling and perhaps make it legal or uh, not, Ill, not illegal across the whole entire uh, 50 states. And when that happens, then we could see some opportunities uh, arise where product can go back and forth uh, ac across that, that border. I guess I look at potentially export markets um, like uh, Australia, maybe there's an opportunity there. I see we have a guest on from Mexico. Perhaps there's an opportunity there to send uh, send some of our oil products down there for further processing. So I, I see, you know, potentially those types of markets evolving for us in the future um, as we get more products available to go onto the marketplace. Okay, great. Thank you, oh, Bridget. Uh, with respect to the, the the comment about competing with the auroras and the canopies, uh, uh -huh. well. They're different. They're they're indoor, and I think they're migrating. I think I'm correct in this saying this migrating more towards um, high end indoor grow, which will be you know kind of a specialty project a product. And I think some of them are looking to maybe partner up or acquire outdoor grows because uh, you know it just it's just so much more price competitive than the indoor. So I, I think we're seeing consolidation starting to occur already. Okay. Okay. Um, another question that we got was how much of the 2020 crop has been processed into product? I think you touched on that a little bit, um, Nico. Yeah, I think Rob mentioned it was about 45%. Yeah, so I think we, we touched on that. I'm just going through the questions here. Uh, there's a follow-up question based on uh, Nico's R&D comments. Does Christina Lake have any IP uh, for any of its uh, growing or extraction processes or other IP? I think that that's something that we're constantly working on. Um, it's 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 kind of an interesting thing because lots of the lots of the things that are out there, some people are bringing it forward like it's it's their proprietary ideas, but they've been there for years. So I 
I know we're conscious of that and anything that we would say as our own truly would be our own and reluctant to try take something that someone has already been used or invented just hasn't had the opportunity to present. Okay, okay. We, we also have a nice comment here from uh, Jeff McAllister from Merriwell. He's uh, listening to your story and finding that you're 90%. Uh, he's an outdoor grower in, um, in uh, Wheatley, Ontario. And uh, they'd like to connect with you and share some of the prototype models they'll be testing on their vertical outdoor grow. So we'll follow up on that. We have a couple of questions uh, that we received uh, in advance for people who couldn't attend. Um, so uh, what products do you currently have for sale? Mer, Rob? Uh, uh, I mentioned this earlier that, uh, you know, obviously when we uh, came out of harvest, we had all of our biomass uh, tested and analyzed for, for full COAs. So we have biomass available. We have Keith, we put in some, uh, some uh, sifting equipment here a couple months ago and we're, we're producing uh, a Keith product that can go into um, the making of hash and different products. Um, through our three labs, our extraction lab, our winterization lab and our distillation lab, we have three different types of oils. We have crude raw oil, we have a winterized oil, and we also have the distillates as, I, as I've mentioned. Okay. And then from that, when Nico talked about uh, terpenes, we can certainly add the terpenes back to the winterized, back to the distillate to make a full spectrum oil as well. So um, our quiver of products is slowly uh, building. Yeah. And like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be um, um, having some good sales here over the next couple of weeks. Okay. And, and do you have any wholesale options? Yeah. I mean, right now, um, Bridget, our company is basically wholesale to wholesale. So we're selling to other LPs, other licensed processors within the Canadian uh, uh, regulatory or Health of, Health of Canada um, banquet of, uh, of companies. Oh, good, good. And and uh, what is Christina Lake doing to operate sustainably? I mean, I, from the gross perspective, our, our soil, for instance, we use our soil for up to 10 years plus. Um, we don't dispose of it. It's a big problem with pea products that they get used once and then they're disposed of. We use it year after year after year and just amend our soil. Um, that's, a, that's a huge one for us. Um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, that, and this kind of reflects back to the energy question as well as currently this morning we were talking about using our byproducts from the winterization and distillation process to heat our greenhouses. So we're, we're working on that right now to go through the regulations to use that byproduct to, to actually heat the greenhouses for the spring months, which would be great if we can figure that out. And then as well as our biomass, like our, our biomass after it's denatured and consider, not considered a cannabis product. We work with local farmers to put it back into the fields as a source of nitrogen and, and fiber for their soils. Okay, um, great answer. And, and, and we have another question here from an, an anonymous attendee. Have you done any auto flower last year or plans to do any? And they'd like your opinion on that. I'll throw that over to, to Merv and Nico. Yeah, so we, we, we do play around with auto flowers. Generally, we don't do uh, pure auto flowers. Um, the yields are just a little bit different than what we're we're looking for, but we we do do some crossing into different auto flowers and use it away as a way of breeding with high end indoor genetics and reducing their flower time. So it, it they are a tool for us. We do include them in some of our breeding programs. Okay, and there's another question here from Alexi. Can you provide a breakdown of OPEX OPEX and explain the key risk areas and sensitivities on these costs? Our, our OPEX uh, expenses are, are generally pretty pretty static. I mean, there's not a lot of up and down there. I mean, you know, you only use so many, so much fertilizer and, and you use so many consumables and we pretty much have those um, determined. So our, our OPEX uh, is, is only gonna be, is only gonna change uh, as you increase your, your crop size. So- yeah, exactly. uh, And change your operation. I think that's okay. fair isn't it? Yeah, um, I think that's all the questions we have right now. I, I don't think we've got, I think we've got everyone. Oh, there's another one just come up here. Uh, are you planning any, uh, are you planning for any growth that extends beyond the land that you own? 
Well, we, we have the capability to do that. It, it's going to be based on demand. And, uh, you know, right now we're getting our feet under us with our, with our 22,500 plants we did last year, which will increase this year probably to 25 or 27,000 in the same footprint. But we have 99 acres uh, really close by that we can develop into growing. It's, it's, it's a AL, ALR, so it's agricultural land. We can't process it, we can grow there and then transport to a processing facility. It's like uh, less than half a kilometer away. So we have the capability where we have cleared the land and we're, we're just getting it prepared. Uh, it's not likely before 2022 at the earliest, probably 23, but we'll see. I mean, uh, the demand will dictate. Okay. Demand will dictate it. And uh, this is the last question from uh, Alexi. Can you type on demand uh, forecasts in Canada and other markets Christina Lake are looking into? Well, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, right now, being a Canadian processor, we're kind of stuck in the Canadian market. Having said that, there are some export markets that we are going to um, look at now that we've got product that is finished and we've got certificates of analysis to go to. So I mentioned earlier, Australia, uh, Jamaica is another possibility, uh, perhaps Israel, Malta are other countries that in the past have taken Canadian products in. So um, those are other areas that we're looking to. You know, like going global, I love that. Oh, so there's a, another comment from Alan Cutler. Uh, Mervyn's comment with regard to mergers and takeovers, is Christina Lake open to either um, uh, a merger or a takeover? <laughs> I think that's an investor relations question. Sorry to put you on the spot, but. It is, but I, I can say that, <sighs> You know what? We look at any 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 option that makes sense. If it makes you better, um, just to do it for the sake of doing it, no. But if it, if the if the marriage would be beneficial for both, we would look at it. You know, especially if somebody is doing something that we're not, and we're doing something that they're not. Exactly. Okay. Um, so there's three more questions that have come up now. Uh, question to Nico. Nico, I know your company is looking at extract products, uh, but are you planning on selling dried flour in the future? Are there other challenges? Are, are there other challenges that 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 approach would um, would present? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, we're we're always open to it, and we are exploring it. I think uh, what we'll probably do is we'll probably phase it slowly. So I think that this year we'll probably do a bunch of flour that's going to be going towards pre rolls. Um, we see a huge opportunity there and we've we've identified that the, the consumers are looking for a low impact sun grown uh, natural product. And so I think we can really capitalize on that um, for selling true flour. I, I don't imagine we'll do too much, if any, this year, the following year, I could see it. I think this year it'll be a free roll product and really get our name out there with that because I think it's a market that we can do very well in. Okay, so considering dried, um, two more questions. Uh, BC Bud is world renowned. Why is cannabis grown in the Kootenay so revered? Why is it? I guess I guess I'll ask all three of you on that one. I think it's just the 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 rich culture, right? And and also, I think it all started with outdoor. And I think the the difference originally was is that the the outdoor cannabis generally from this area was it was just a, a bit better than most because of the the, the environment, and mm -hmm. so. You know, some of the some of the stuff that was coming from different areas didn't quite have as long of a season or as dry of a season. So it was it was harder, it was more challenging for the growers. And so I think early on it kind of cut it got its name cut from you know high quality outdoor that was a just a bit a bit ahead of the, the rest of the country and especially into the export markets at that time. And then it continued on through the indoor as well. Okay. So this is the Bridget, final question. Bridget, oh, sorry, sorry go Bridget. on. We're still such a, at such an infant infant stage, um, but to add to what Nico said, if you want to take it to the the wine growing regions of the area, whether it's Burgundy, whether it's Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley, there's something involved in the terroir or the water, and the Kootenai terroir and the Kootenai water just happens to grow good cannabis. Awesome, awesome! <laughs> I, love, I love the whole image of. Christina, like, um, so last two questions, we've still got some time. 
Uh, this is an expansion question. I love this. This is this is for you, Rob. How about starting a twin facility across the border in the U.S. if you're only 500 meters away? Like, what what's the opportunity there? I guess it goes back to legislation. But over to you. Well, yeah, legislation. I don't know if I want to go to jail in the U.S. But yeah, no, we would be we would be uh, more than delighted to have something uh, uh, just across the border that we could uh, work work together without a doubt. But uh, it all comes down to legalities. Exactly. Um, the, one more question. Nico, uh, you mentioned the team is taking about 1,500 cuttings a day at the moment. Are mother plants rotated every year? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they definitely are. And then also, sometimes we'll bring it back to, we haven't done it on this site yet because we've only been licensed for just over a year. But we bring them back to tissue culture to clean them up. And then also we'll bring them back to seed and then restart from seed and bring them up <laughs> fresh as well. Okay. Well, I think that's all our questions. It's been an awesome hour talking about Christina Lake with Merv and Nico and Rob. Thank you so much to all of you and to Christina Lake for joining us today. If you'd like to connect with the Christina Lake team, you can reach out to Jamie Far Farley at investors at clcannabis.com. CL CL it, it looks like CLC Cannabis, but... Uh, stay tuned um, and uh, for uh, more Marigold Live events. And don't forget to sign up for our uh, Women Wellness and Cannabis Conference on May 26th and 27th. So thank you very much. And uh, any last words um, from Merv, Rob, Nico? Oh, thank we, we have, we know we've had challenges uh, in year one and we've done a lot of things good and uh, really well. And we've done a few, there's a few things that could stand improvement and we were addressing all those things. And I think we're in a much better position this year because now we have all our build out complete, our, our equipment in place. Uh, we can now do a timely harvest uh, in, a, in a more efficient manner, doing it uniformly rather than cramming. So, we're looking forward to this year. We think it's going to be a, a much better uh, scenario. So we're, we're, we're excited about it. Plus, we're going to broaden out our product range, too. We're, we're excited about that, too. It's, it's, we're excited for you. Rob, anything from you? Add no, to what thank, was saying? Yeah, thank you very much for everybody attending. And uh, we look forward to working uh, with some of you in the future. And like Merv says, every week we get better and better at what we do. And we learn something new every week. And... Uh, it's exciting. It is exciting. It's an, it's an incredible operation that you have. And Nico, last word to you in terms of the growing season ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for the time, their time. And yeah, I really appreciate everybody's support and feel free to reach out with any other questions. Well, thanks so much. Well done, you guys. We're getting tons of like, thank you. You're all beautiful. Thanks for joining us. So it was, it was our pleasure and privilege to talk to you about Christina Lake today. Thank you very, very much. And um, this will be, uh, we'll be sharing uh, for all the registrants, the recorded version. And if you have any questions, it'll all be posted and we'll be reaching out to everyone who's registered. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks, Bridget. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.